All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming today. Um, we're here to talk about supercharging Drupal migrations with ChatGPT, unleashing efficiency and enhancing development, if that's not a mouthful. If that's not what you want to see, there's two other really great sessions. And if you leave right now, I'm totally not offended. And if you leave later, that's cool too. Um, there's a WordPress one going on two doors down. And right next door, my colleague Aubrey will be talking about uh, front end fun things, uh, SAS in 2023. Hi, I'm Matt. Um, I'm a senior developer and owner at Lullabot. It sounds fancy, but we're all owners, um, which is really great. It's an employee-owned 100% organization. Um, I live in Holyoke, Colorado, which is the middle of nowhere in extreme northeast Colorado on a farm. Um, I've been on Drupal for like six, 16 years and at Lullabot for somewhere around 13 years. And since we're talking a little bit about generative AI, I thought I'd ask ChatGPT to, to write a quick biography for me. Um, <laughs> Turns out it wasn't too bad. Um, it somehow thinks that I know something about WordPress and Magento, which I don't. Um, it says I'm really smart about front-end development too, not so much, um, but not too bad. I guess it probably read the Lullabot website at one point and didn't know about me, but knew more about the company and the people that worked for. I'm an Emmy award-winning web developer. How many people can say that? That's kind of fun. This guy's in the news again, so I had to dust this slide off. Um, not necessarily for good reasons he's in the news, um, but I was on a, a project that was a big project, um, which, was, which was great. Um, Lullabot is a strategy, design, and Drupal development company that creates large-scale digital publishing systems. So we do Drupal and create big websites and have the opportunity to work with um, some really great clients along the way, which is super fun. So... We're here to talk about migrations primarily, and we're talking about moving data from one data source into probably a Drupal 9, 10 website, modern Drupal, right? Migrating that data from here to there. So it really comes in two parts. Um, the first is the migration side of things. Um, that's, we'll be talking a little bit about that. I'll be trying to take you through how a migration will work within Drupal. Sadly, I'm not gonna be able to talk completely about migrations in 45 minutes because we have a, a second topic that I've started to use with the migrations, which is utilizing ChatGPT as a part of my uh, development workflow, um, making the two of them kind of work together uh, and see how it works. But really, this is why we're all here, right? We probably have Drupal data on an old Drupal site or maybe some other site that isn't Drupal, but this, this end of life for Drupal 7 is really kind of blooming uh, for, for a lot of people and trying to move the data off of Drupal 7, which one day will become insecure, into modern Drupal and, and, a, and a good way of doing that. The good news is, is that migrations in Drupal are not a new thing. Um, it's something that has been done for many years. The picture on the left is probably when I first heard about Drupal migrations and migrate module, um, which was at DrupalCon San Francisco in 2010. Um, since then, there have been a couple of major projects that have happened in the Drupal world that have funded the migration space and put a lot of development hours into making sure that you can migrate data into Drupal um, fairly seamlessly, and, and, it's, and it's a very robust system. Um, I'm on a project right now, um, and what I'm talking about is general information, but if you want to know more about the kinds of things I'm working on, um, there was a podcast that was released uh, earlier this year uh, talking about um, structured data and uh, a major group of websites that uh, Lullabot has had the chance to work on. So when we're dealing with migrations, one thing you kind of need to consider is the data you're dealing with, obviously, right? You need to know what you have and where it's going. So figuring that out is really step one. And whether that happens on, on a spreadsheet or, or your corner of your notebook or something, you need to decide what kind of data you have and where the data is going. Um, I read an article or I saw a headline or something once that was like, don't waste the opportunity for a good migration um, because it's true. Like maybe you did something 10 years ago when you built this website and you want to do it a little bit differently. You want to maybe improve the way your data is structured or something. This is the chance to do that. And a migration gives you the opportunity to maybe adjust the data you have along the way. That's going to happen um, sitting around the table with all the stakeholders. One developer isn't going to be able to sit in the corner and say, this looks like that, so that's where it needs to go. Anybody that touches your website needs to, needs to be involved in making these decisions. 
And together, you can come together and, and figure that out. Um, they, they may seem, it may seem like it's silly. It's like, this is a body field. Does it have HTML? Yes, it has HTML. Okay. Is that the same type of HTML we want to support in the future? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but getting together and making those decisions, I think those two things are the hardest part of any migration process. Like figuring out what you have and where it's going and making sure you're pretty accurate in that analysis. So I mentioned within Drupal, we have some pretty, um, robust solutions to migration. If you were to install Drupal 10 today and go to the modules page and filter for migrate, this is what you see. We have uh, three modules that ship with Drupal core. We have migrate, migrate Drupal, and migrate Drupal UI. So the migrate module is kind of the nuts and bolts. Migrate Drupal is some helpers to help you move data from a Drupal site to this new Drupal site. And the UI is a user interface that helps you do those things along the way. Being Drupal, of course, you can find lots of other things. Um, there are, are plenty of co uh, contributed modules in the space that allow you to do whatever you need to do with other types of migrations. So the screenshot on my right is a website that I've, I've dealt with in the past um, that has a couple of extra modules. I would recommend if you're dealing with any kind of migration, you're going to need to add the Migrate Tools and Migrate Plus module. Um, if you sat me in the corner and said, Matt, what's the difference between the two? I would say, I don't know. I just install them and they give you a lot of extra stuff that's useful. <laughs> so install those two things and they're going to give you a lot of extra stuff that's useful. Um, one extra thing for a lot of the migrations I've been working with is I use the Migrate Source CSV um, module. And what that does is that it allows me to import data in a CSV file into my Drupal site. Um, we found that a lot of our uh, source sites are different, and the easiest way for us to do it is to run database queries and export the data, and the data goes to a CSV file, and with the migrate source CSV module, we can munch that into our new Drupal site. Um, and that also allows us to make our data maybe a little more right along the way, because we can use that query and maybe make the value comma separated or whatever. We can do magic in SQL and allow our Drupal site to eat it up with the migrate source CSV module. At the very base of things, a migration is this YAML file. Um, YAML is kind of a, a structured data thing that is all over Drupal if you haven't seen that. So we have a bunch of YAML files that live inside a migrations directory that lives inside of a custom module inside of our modules directory in Drupal. So we have a custom module that has a migrations directory and then these YAML files that have migration information, or migration, essentially a, a list of instructions of how this migration is gonna work. Um, at the top, I know it's kind of small, you don't need to really read it, just know that there's like basic information about this migration. What's it called? Is it a part of a group that you know, might include other migrations? I mentioned we were using the migrate source CSV, so the next line up there that's really small and you can't see um, just says, where's the CSV file where your data is coming from? Where it really gets interesting and where most of the work is done is there's a line here that says process. Uh, beneath the process um, is like, we have a field called this and it needs to go to a field called that. And maybe there needs to be some transformation that happens along the way. A lot of times, title turns into title. So I have a, a header in my CSV called title and it's just gonna go right to the title field. No big deal, right? But maybe we need the UID and there's extra plugins that help us along the way. I'm doing a migration lookup on this one that goes back to a previous migration I've done and says, hey, the ID that you migrated into is the ID I need now and there's some linking that happens between the two. Lots of plugins um, that come with other contributed modules and you can even write your own. <clears throat> When you're running migrations, usually you use Drush. I think I found it to be the, the most useful way to, to deal with migrations because you can, you can do anything with the Drush commands that uh, come with, I think it's actually with the migrate tools module, but I could be wrong. Um, so this is just running Drush migrate status. Um, and it says, here's a bunch of migrations that are on your website. Right here you see a bunch of zeros because I haven't actually run those migrations on this particular version of the website. Um, if I wanted to run the migrations, I'll run drush mim, which is migrate import, and then name the migration. And 
I'm only doing like 37 and 88 nodes. It's, it's not a long migration, but if it were a long migration, you get feedback along the way and, and um, really, really useful, robust tools that help out. So you end up dealing with running, rolling back migrations all with these Drush commands. Um, and it's great. You can be comfortable with the terminal and do that. So how are we going to learn how to do this migration stuff, right? Of course, all over Drupal.org is, is great information. If you look inside of some of those migration um, modules, you have uh, other example code that gives you maybe like you could learn, read the code, read the documentation in that code and, and learn how to make some of this stuff happen. I actually ended up watching a lot of Drupalize Me videos. I don't know that they know I still have an account, um, but <laughs> it is great. Um, Drupalize Me used to be a, a Lullabot thing, and uh, it's since spun off and still thriving and, and doing great things. Um, hi, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of the, the bottom line, though, right? I, any good developer is going to run to Google and say, how do I do this thing? Um, and that's certainly something you can do, but when you end up reading a lot of documentation, you're reading a lot of Google <laughs> posts, and you're up against deadlines, that might not work the best way possible, right? Because you're, you're, you, maybe something isn't exactly clear, and you, you need to figure out something else so that you can have complete understanding. So if we go back to this spring, um, my wife is an English teacher. She teaches uh, seventh grade through high school and is an adjunct, adjunct professor um, for the local community college. And I was talking with her this spring about how this, you know, chat GPT, generative AI is going to totally change her world because asking kids to write an essay, sure, they can have a computer write an essay, right, and how, how that's going to work. She's learned that she can actually use that in, as a part of her planning as well and, and grading and test making and that kind of thing. Like, it, it's, it's super handy. So I've been kind of fiddling with uh, chat GPT, generative AI, for quite a while now because of uh, her situation. Um, dealing in education. So one day I was up under the gun and I was trying to understand how to make some tweaks to one of the migrations I was doing. I was like, what's ChatGPT going to tell me? I'm like, well, let's find out. So I started off with a, with a pretty decent prompt. It was like, hey, you're a Drupal expert. I'm a Drupal person who kind of knows what he's doing. Um, maybe you can help me out. It was like, yes, of course I can help you out. <laughs> and I started asking it questions. And I learned that it had a lot of answers. Um, and I kind of continued this conversation for a pretty significant amount of time, going back and forth, learning about what I needed to do to make migrations work a little differently, uh, maybe something that was erroring for me, and, and it kept coming back with code examples and, and YAML tweaks and changes, and turned out to be something that was pretty useful to me. So one example that I came up with was here we have a, a basic CSV file at the top. You, you see that there's a node ID uh, created and changed timestamps, which happen to be in a Unix uh, style timestamp. Um, then there's title, body, you know, basic stuff that you might migrate with the node. At the bottom is a screenshot of my database tool, um, which is kind of the destination database. Um, I have this field news display date value, and I'm, I'm migrating this content in, and there's no display date. Um, I do have these other dates that are close enough, but my Unix timestamp isn't the same as the value that Drupal is storing. It's storing a year, month, day timestamp. It's like, surely there's a way to do that, right? So I said, hey, ChatGPT, how do I do this? I have a Unix timestamp, um, and I want to make it into a Drupal date field, and I want to do it inside the YAML. Surely there's like a plugin or something. And it was like, yeah, I think we can figure that out. And it said, to be able to do that, it's actually not real hard. Inside the process, we have our field, and there's this format date plugin. And we have a to from format and a to format, and it's using the PHP date strings, which I recognized immediately. So I was like, oh yeah, so that's, that's not too bad at all. Along with the YAML file, it explained all of the, the variables and all of the things along the way. It was like, hey, so the to format is this, the source is this, the from format. If you were to sit down and read this all, you have immediate understanding of how to do that. And that was super handy. So I, I learned that talking to a computer was really great. And you could continue like, hey, 
Earlier, you showed me this static, static map plugin. So it, it, what it amounts to is it's a, a hash table. If you have one ID on your source and you have an ID in your destination, and the two don't necessarily match, but you always know that a two is a, is a B and a, a three is a C, those, those kind of need to link up together. And I, I saw in an example that it had given me was a static map plugin, and it was like, hey, that's great. Which side is the source and which side is the destination? Because I'm not sure I really read that the first time when you showed it to me. It was like, oh, yeah. No problem. Um, we have our source is the status column. We have active is one and archived is two. And the left is the source and the right side is the destination. And by the way, here's a bunch more words of me explaining what I need to know. And I was like, sweet. So for, sitting to, for explaining things like process plugins that exist, I, I found it to be pretty reasonable. And uh, ChatGPT was giving me pretty decent answers. But I also found that as you continue to delve into asking generative AI to, to solve all of your coding problems, a lot of times it resulted in this weird Rube Goldberg-esque um, answer because it was like, hey, you're technically right, but it's a little weird. So I was trying to figure out this like, idea of a fallback. Um, I have one field, but if it's empty, I want to actually migrate the value from another field because like, if this time is empty, I've got this other time and it would work for me too. And it was like, sure, we've got this plugin called Fallback. And you can then just list which field, Fallback, field source one, field source two. Maybe it's timestamp one, timestamp two, whatever your fields are called. And it was like, you just use this plugin called Fallback. And I was like, sweet, copy paste that real quick, plug it in, fails. It's like, there's no plugin called Fallback. And I was like, hey, there's no plugin called Fallback. And it was like, oh yeah, you're right. But if you want it to work that way, <laughs> here's a plugin, right? Copy and paste this, put it into your plugins directory. It's going to work great. I was like, no way. It did. <laughs> and I went to go search Google, and I, I went through a few different sources, and I, I couldn't find this on the internet, and maybe I didn't look long enough. Surely it came from somewhere, or at least the idea came from somewhere nearby. I didn't, I, I started searching like particular sets of strings from what it was trying to tell me to do. I didn't find it, like at least this example in whole. So it definitely generated something and it kind of worked for me. As I later learned more, I think I could have done the same thing with a default value fallback plugin or something. Anyway, there was another way that probably was a little easier to do it. But in the short term, this worked really great. And in the project I'm working on, the migrations are actually um, fairly transient. Um, once the data is moved, that code doesn't run ever again. So done is great. And maybe perfect is the enemy of done. Um, so it was really helpful here. <clears throat> Sometimes it's less helpful um, and kind of starts spitting out this, this dumpster fire of information to you. And it was like, hey, cool, I need a transform plugin, but I really hate subbing out all this code. I need the entity type manager injected into my transform plugin, which I kind of searched for, and I, I failed. And it was like, oh, come on, chat GPT could stub out some code for me. Um, so I would have to, I knew that I had to do something in the, in the create method and then the, what is it, the construct method. and you know, just get it out of the service container because I needed to just load a freaking node. Like, node load is too hard for us in Drupal 10 now because we've got to do all this other stuff. Anyway, that didn't work. It gave me a code example that was pretty bad. And I found along the way, it was like, hey, you told me if there's this trim plugin, that's not a thing either. Um, I think what it was trying to do was like, there's a callback plugin that essentially calls a PHP function and there's a trim PHP function and that would have worked fine. Close but no cigar, right? It was telling me that I was trying to do, I was asking it a similar related Drupal question um, about bulk updating path auto aliases programmatically. And it was telling me there was this path auto bulk update service, which totally doesn't exist. That said, if you look at like the rest of Drupal, that's how some of the other things work. And it makes sense that it came up with that solution, but it doesn't work that way. And it, it wasn't smart enough. And then it gave me another plugin that was, that was, it was like, did you write that? It was like, <laughs> Yeah, I kind of made it up, but <laughs> sometimes debugging, it doesn't work that great either. Um, when I was doing a migration of menu links, um, you can read this if you care to, but it's really not necessary. I was doing a, a migration of menu links 
um, trying to migrate from a CSV parent and children, and then like the stub out process of the parent link when the child link gets migrated first, and doing it from a CSV was not exactly what you expected it to be, um, because the ID that was being related wasn't quite right, and I, I thought I was doing it right based on what I could tell um, from all of the migration things that I had read and known about in the past, but I kept getting this, this weird error, and it was like, hey, these could be the solutions to your weird error. Essentially, you have problems, and if you read all of those and try it, it's like, no, n none of that solved my problem, and I thought, Maybe I'm doing something wrong. I ended up running to Drupal Slack, talked to a real person. They said, oh, you're doing it wrong. I said, okay, I get it. It makes sense. I am, I am doing it wrong. Um, so real people are still good. Yay, Drupal community, right? That's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, essentially, the migration didn't work the way I thought it was going to work. And when I'm starting to do you know, like custom CSV migrations and I'm not doing the Drupal to Drupal migrations, there are a lot of tools that, would, that don't exist for me that would otherwise have been there if it were a Drupal to Drupal migration. So to this point, I've just been using ChatGPT 3.5, which is the, the create an account and use it for free. I was curious the other day, I was like, well, what happens if I give them 20 bucks and I try <laughs> ChatGPT 4, right? Which I did, and it turned out to be pretty useful. Remember the example where I said, hey, I want to stub out the transform plugin with the entity type manager injected? Um, it did it. Uh, ChatGPT4 on the right says you need to implement Container Factory. It was like, oh, well, of course I do, right? I, I figured there was something like that that allowed me to get things out of the service container. Um, the version on the left, ChatGPT3.5, wasn't smart enough to figure that out. So 4 was, in fact, better. Um, when I was doing that menu migration, stubbing out the parent-child links, I, I had some previous discussions with ChatGPT3.5 that were not um, making me feel good about myself because the answers that it was returning weren't very good. Um, but GPT-4 like told me, hey, yeah, um, the migration lookup is really where all of that stub out code lives and there's gonna be no magic and if you're gonna go on your own, you're gonna have to deal with it on your own. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not gonna do it that way. Um, <clears throat> so to start on some of the takeaways of my interesting conversations I've had with robots is that the conversation aspect of working with generative AI, uh, ChatGPT is pretty handy. Um, I just heard Matt Glayman talk and say that it's like your intern, um, and that's about as far as you would trust it. Like maybe it can get some good information for you, but is it always going to be right? Probably not. It's an intern. Um, it's not perfect, um, but I found it to be a pretty decent way to learn and experiment and try new things and. The whole conversation thing, I think, is the most useful to me because if I'm reading a piece of documentation or if I'm reading somebody's blog post and something doesn't make sense, what do I do with that? It's like, I can't yell at my computer screen. I can yell at a chat bot and maybe it'll help. And sometimes it does. And that conversation is, is pretty great. I do recommend if you're going to use it, I think you start with a good prompt um, and continue talking in that same conversation using Drupal specific language. The conversation gets better the more it understands what you're looking for and previous you know, things you're like, oh no, I'm using a CSV migration, I'm not using a Drupal to Drupal migration. It was like, oh, okay, I got you. And then all of the other examples it gave me after that was a CSV migration because it knew what I was after. And that's a handy thing. Um, using Drupal specific language I think is very important. A lot of times, um, you know, I've been doing Drupal for a long time now, so I end up with my own vernacular of the thingy and the, you know, the other whatchamacallit. And ChatGPT doesn't know about the thingy and the whatchamacallit. It knows about, you know, taxonomy, term, entities, and that kind of thing. It's obviously read, read Drupal code or Drupal documentation or Drupal.org or something of the like because it's smart enough to come up with decent answers. Um, so using Drupal specific code will help keep things on the right track. And kind of like I said with the conversation, if something doesn't make sense, keep asking the questions, but it's going to lie to you. <laughs> it's not always going to come back with the right answer. It's going to say something that this is, the, this is the right answer, but it doesn't work. What that should tell you is that you're kind of on the edge of doing it the right way. Um, Maybe what you're asking for isn't possible, 
because the robot can't figure it out, so you're obviously having issues too. Um, maybe you're doing it wrong. So keep adjusting your thinking, trying new things, um, figure things out. I found ChatGPT4 is better. Is it worth it to you to give them 20 bucks a month or whatever the number is? Maybe. Maybe it depends on how much you're using it. Um, and this is kind of my last caveat. Um, at Lullabot, there's the Lullabot security team that cares a lot with about the uh, configuration of my laptop, um, as well as other things and how we're using tools. Um, I never sent Lullabot specific or client specific information over the wire to ChatGPT, because I don't know what they're gonna do with it. I can ask them Drupal questions and general questions, but is it something that they're going to use and then it ends up somewhere where I don't intend it to be? That wouldn't be good. So I, I'm, I'm good with asking it and dealing with it for general knowledge, um, but what are you feeding the bot? Um, just kind of be mindful of that. That's, that's what I would warn you. A couple other things that I found was really smart um, dealing with um, ChatGPT in my development. Um, I had a source that was the actual like human readable value of this key value thing in Drupal that we do with the vertical pipe. And my source was the human readable version, but I needed the destination to be the key to put it in that select list field. And so I needed it to kind of flip that around for me so that I could build a, a quick plugin to do that mapping. And I was like, hey, I've got this list. And it's like, cool. I recognize exactly what this list is. I was like, that's not helpful. Um, but I want an associative array out of this list. And it was like, yeah, I can do that. It was like, okay, but now I want you to flip keys and values. It was like, okay, I'm going to use the array flip <laughs> PHP function. It was like, that's great, but I want to be able to copy and paste the result to that. It was like, okay, yeah, I can do that for you. So it copied and pasted the result of that. That would have taken a lot of like copying and pasting or at least thinking through how I was going to script that um, with a PHP script and, and get that result. Um, you know, that took 30, 40 seconds or something. Um, and it was pretty darn handy. Um, the best part is one of the values that ha has an apostrophe in it. And so when you're dealing with migrations, you kind of have that canary in the coal mine value that you're like always looking at, because that's the edge case. Is that going to work right? So we have O'Brien, which is the human readable version. There's no space, O apostrophe Brian. And I was like, when it built me that array, it automatically escaped out the apostrophe. And I was like, did it do it right? I'm not sure. Let's try it. And it worked great. So yay for ChatGPT for kind of releasing my mind from thinking about that. Um, turned out to be really handy. Another thing that's really great about ChatGPT is that it helped me write the uh, session description for this very session. Because I don't want to write that thing, right? It's like, I kind of said, this is what I kind of want to talk about. And it was like, here's what you can talk about. And I was like, yeah, but don't use Drupal 9, use Drupal 10. You know, small adjustments along the way. And here we go. Um, also, coming up with a title was pretty handy. I was like, hey, give me five titles. It was like, hey, that first one's good. That's, that's what I'm going to do. So um, turned out to be pretty decent. Um, plenty of time for questions. Yeah. When you work with ChatGPT and you're asking it to do something a little more complex, mm -hmm. sometimes it can be difficult to know if it's doing it correctly or not. One thing I've tried in the past is actually asking it to write tests for the code that oh. it just wrote because it's easier to kind of go through and read its tests it's pretty to good see suggestion. if it's testing. Do you have any other ideas for how to kind of get a handle on the quality of a solution if it's something that's not just easily seeable? I read it, I plug it in, I run it. Okay. I mean, I'm pretty, pretty low-key, easy going on that yeah. route. The suggestion, though, if you didn't hear that in the back of the room, was maybe you could tell ChatGPT to write tests for the code that it's writing. And that's a great idea. I think that's awesome, because I hate writing tests. And if it can help me do that, yeah, absolutely. Back. I mean, it's not a question, but I think it's a similar vein as uh, when I'm reading code that somebody else wrote, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, paste the code in there and ask them, like, what, what, what is this doing? It's like a cache function. Like it did something that I didn't even look at. It was impenetrable the way that it just, I didn't understand. And it was like, oh, this is what this does. And it's making it so that it returns the user's cache before it checks the actual cache in the database. 
And then I thought, well, then you know, I could use it to write my documentation, because I hate having to like, phrasing it and all that. So it's nice, like what you showed, you know, like, this is my code. Can you help me document it so that I can help other users know what's going on? Yeah. That's great. His suggestion was, um, you know, if you had a piece of code that he wasn't quite sure what it was doing, paste it in there, say, hey, what is this doing? And then beyond that, help document it, which is, I think, a great usage. Um, of course, read it and confirm that it's right when it's done. But <laughs> you have to, yeah, you have to yeah, I mean, see if that makes sense. At the end of the day, it is your intern. I like, I like yeah. Matt's um, suggestion there. Did you use ChatGTP to do your presentation? I did not, no. I, like I did, uh, there's another program out there where you can actually uh, suggest what you want for a YouTube video and it'll actually produce a YouTube video for you. That's pretty it's cool. Really incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, you can definitely do a lot. No, I didn't, I didn't use it to make my slides today. It might have been more interesting if I did. There was <laughs> lots of words up there. That's a lot of words. Too bad I'm not reading them. Anything else? Anybody else use this in a better way than me? This is just kind of one person's experience with trying to learn something and figuring out a way to help a robot learn. Teach me, Joe. I mean, did you experiment at all with like kind of like architecture type questions? Like in Drupal seven, I used this module. I didn't. So how should I do that in Drupal? No, my, my, that's a great question. You're like asking about how Drupal seven worked and how maybe it could apply to modern Drupal. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't do any of that. A lot of the work that I've been doing and probably I will be doing for the foreseeable future is move data, shove data from here to there. And um, it turned out to be really handy to do that. But I, I don't see why it wouldn't have knowledge of that, especially if it's read change logs or something like that, um, which is all publicly out there on Drupal.org. The potential is there for it to come up with a decent answer. Yeah, yeah sure. You could be like, I'm trying to port my custom code. Here's so, the Drupal 7 code. Can you rewrite it for me? And be like, kind of. If, if you came here like hoping that you could just route all this stuff through ChatGPT, that would have been awesome. I still think a person is going to end up, at least today, um, making sure your migration is moving data the way it needs to move. Matt, Matthew. Thanks, Matt. It does seem like doing a migration is sort of uniquely useful for this type of work because you know exactly how it looks now and you, how it should look in the new thing, so you can just sort of test that. So it does seem like a good thing to start with versus like the architectural, what's the best module kind of thing. But I don't know, maybe there's other like things that we have to do that are tedious that we can really see without having to worry as much about does this have to be perfect? Do they get just the right process? plug in because ultimately I just need to see this title is this here, here. Ultimately the data needs to move and it needs to end up in the right location looking the right way in the right format. You don't care how it got there, right? Um, and it's something that I think a lot of us are going to end up facing in the near future. Yeah. Is it reasonable to expect ChatGPT to at some point uh, just take the source CSV and then give you the Drupal 10 SQL dump? I mean, like, we, we, we're, <laughs> so we're, we're assuming that this all needs to, to run through the Drupal migration system, but if, like, that mindset of, I don't care how it gets from one format yeah. to another, if we're starting in CSV and we eventually need a Drupal 10 database. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna let it run the rush fans on production? Um, <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I have asked ChatGPT to write WP CLI commands, the Drush equivalent, uh, and that was helpful. I asked ChatGPT to um, help me make a giant WordPress database by downloading novels from the Gutenberg project cool. and then inserting them into WordPress via WP CLI, which is like something I could have figured out how to do over like 15 minutes or half an hour, but ChatGPT did it in like five seconds. Yeah. I, I think the potential is there for it to, I mean, these tools to continue to get better. I mean, it's going to need not only the, the source data, and I mean, with the source data, it has knowledge of what that's in. Um, it needs, would need Drupal config to know where it's going, um, which I guess there's no secret there either, right? You can mm -hmm. throw it all you want. I don't know. Yeah. I think potential's there. Yeah. 
you still have to say A goes to B. Like yeah. someone needs to make that decision. Yeah. Go ahead. Had a thought because we have one, you know, the live site which has JSON API open mm -hmm. to the public, and then we have our new site that has the JSON API open to the public. Could we just have ask chat GTP? Could you migrate this site to this site using Drupal 8 or Drupal 10? Uh, and have it. I mean, it's it's not going to have knowledge of the field. Oh, yeah, maybe it would, because it's got well, the JSON. Yeah, I don't know. It's it, an interesting thought. It, if you run through and give it all the JSON endpoints on yep. each side and be like, yep. here's all your data. Yeah. Is, is, as long as the fields match up, I mean, the potential's there for that to be functional. Um, if something is different from source to destination, then yeah, it's a good thought, yeah. I find it's, it's useful sometimes to get a, um, a second opinion from ChatGDP with that yeah. regenerated answer. And sometimes it'll come out with something wildly different. Or if I need a list of something, I'll say, can you please provide 10 additional things? And it'll give me, like, it keeps giving back good information like you showed. That's a great suggestion, the regenerate answer. I've never clicked on it. <laughs> it gives I you should same, give it a try. Yeah, and it saves the old answers, too. So you say, is this better than the last one? And you yeah. can provide an answer to that one. Uh, but it'll save all of those potential answers for you. Cool. Very good idea. I like that. Super, Matthew. All right, I'll admit I've never actually even used any of these tools. It's but I've we heard that you have to like give it your information to to I, use them. Is that true? I needed a login and I logged in with my Google account. So how much information went there? Sure. I I don't know. And and is it doesn't don't some of the search engines like Bing or something use this? And did you ever compare your answers with other sorts of? I hadn't. Tools? No, this was one tool that I, I settled in on and, and continued to try and bang on to figure out what it could tell me. I haven't used any other tools except for the 3.5 and the 4. I, I, I used the Bing to see if it was yeah. the free version, and it just kept giving me advertisements. It was oh. clearly Microsoft was using this to leverage it to make money. It wasn't uh, going to be helpful. It was like I don't know if I didn't ask the questions right or not. So how do I help with my Drupal migration? Bing will come back and say call Pantheon? Or <laughs> 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 companies that can help you do this. And I was like, that's not, I could just do that. Yeah. 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 And I haven't used, I, somebody mentioned Copilot in the previous session, um, and I haven't tried any of that. I, There's I, some I, other ones like to like Llama and Bard. Yeah. yeah. I did fiddle with Llama for a while locally, um, which, I've heard that LOM is actually better than ChatGPT. I as long as you it depends on the data set it's trained on. That's that's the bottom line. And I had it locally and it was pretty dumb because it wasn't very smart yet. So I kind of gave up on it, but it's worth it's worth something. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Have you tried any content generation or taxonomy identification tagging? I haven't. No. That's a really good thought, though, as far as like tagging content because it can look at content and maybe make a reasonable assumption that this is a press release or this is a blog post or something like that. Like, I don't. I have it. That's a good thought. Um. I, I think that they they mentioned you know like in the media how it's it's getting worse or it's like it's starting. I think it's just I could imagine that it's kind of a mirror reflecting back on the code that's out there. And so if if everyone started writing their code from ChatGPT, then ChatGPT would continue to generate code like ChatGPT. And so I think that you know this is not going to take away our jobs because I think you will always need, or at least as far as I can see, in the next five to ten years at least that. Humans will still be needed to sort of... Today, that's true, right? I'm always nice to the bot, though, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it's really nice to me. It's like, oh, let me know if I can help you out some other way. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Chat GPT, give me a list of developers who are no longer needed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right on. Thanks, everybody.